Well, it sure is a joy to be here with you today. And uh, they uh, forecasted a great forecast for us, so we're going to enjoy that. And the Lord uh, al always gives us a great forecast, especially that you're saved and you know the Lord. <clears throat> I am excited for your church. I'm excited for uh, your new properties and new buildings coming. And that's always exciting to me to see progress in the name of the Lord, especially as where a church is concerned. And uh, I'm just glad to be a part today uh, with your worship service uh, as we open the scriptures and try to teach from them uh, that God would suit a blessing to you. A little report, my wife is doing well. Uh, she is basically homebound. Uh, as they tell me, that's that's her status. Don't tell her that. She <laughs> she doesn't go anywhere. I uh, she hasn't gone anywhere for four months, and uh, she's had some struggles. But her spirit is good. She reminded me as I went out the door, "You preach good. I do share in all the rewards that you may get." Matter of fact, it's a 50-50 there. She remind me of that. She reads her Bible every day. She prays every day. So we got quite a team. I'm here uh, out on the front line, and she's back behind the lines, and she's praying. She's calling in long-range artillery uh, from the Lord. Amen? So uh, uh, that's a little story, little status on Bonnie, and she still enjoys the ministry. She loves the Lord, and she's glad that our children all serve the Lord. All seven children are in church someplace. Uh, the oldest son is preaching. He pastors a Tree of Life Baptist Church in Morristown, Tennessee. He'd be preaching this morning. And then uh, the next son is Jeremiah. He's 47. He's preaching at Bible Baptist Church in Covington, Kentucky for Pastor Bill Baker in Brother Baker's absence. He's there filling that pulpit. And uh, his full-time job is assistant pastor at Hope Baptist Church, which is my home church. And then there's myself, the dad, I'm out preaching this morning. And then there's Titus, Titus Paul. He's the younger of all of us. He's about 30. And I don't believe he's preaching this morning, but he did graduate from West Coast Baptist College and wanted to be in the ministry, whatever God opens the door. He pastored for a number of years. But right now he's not pastoring, so pray for Titus. I told him we're all working today but you, son. So he said he would pray. He sent me a message, I'll be praying. So that's good. First Timothy chapter two, that's a little introduction of get to catch you up to date on family things. Uh, but first Timothy chapter two, this is a lesson that I put together a while back in a series of some 22 lessons in the book of Timothy for Hoosier Hills Bible Institute. We're uh, glad to report that we was able to start a Bible Institute uh, a few years ago, and then I'm the, uh, the starter of that. Pastor Tom and I do the bulk of the teaching there. Jeremiah does some. Uh, but Jeremiah has earned his master's degree from Slidell Baptist College. And uh, it's, uh, you know, educations aren't, you can make it a long way without one if you got a Bible and you're saved and you know God. But I've always liked uh, education and I like to see folks ever learning of the things of God. So this is a lesson from our studies verse by verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 and uh, it seemed to fit with our day. Uh, this is a day of remembrance for those that have passed on and I put together a new message for the morning message on memorials and Memorial Day. But the lesson goes along with <clears throat> our form of government and human government and why we exist, how we exist, and the fact that we're free as a nation, uh, but uh, again, why we're free as people in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I won't read all 15 verses for the sake of time. I think we'll dive in kind of, and we'll look there in verse 2, and uh, I'll draw your attention primarily to those thoughts for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Thought that fits well. I enjoy 
a peaceable life today in America. I'm not looking at communism. I'm not looking at socialism. I think we're looking at all those things, but our liberty and our republic still stand. So, uh, and I'm, I'm happy for that today. I really am. So let's pray as we get into the lesson. Father, thank you for a wonderful church to come to, a wonderful people to share with. And then, Lord, you've uh, called me to teach and to preach your word and help me just to do that today that it might be pleasing and a blessing to those that have come. May we relax uh, in the spirit and, uh, and benefit from the soul feeding of your word. May you speak to our hearts and guide us and comfort us and uh, encourage us uh, in, in these, these days. I pray, Lord, now in your blessing as we teach, give me utterance to speak just your word and your things. May what we say and do be pleasing in your eyes today. It's in Jesus' lovely name we pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. So for kings and for all that are in authority, we're supposed to pray for our leaders. And I do pray for my leaders, probably more today <clears throat> as an older man than I did when I was a younger man. And uh, I probably understand it a little better now. So it's amazing how you get a little age on you and things start uh, changing and you start rethinking some things. And, uh, but one thing that has never changed or had to change is the Word of God. Amen. So I find myself ever lining up with the Word of God. So for kings and for all that are in authority, that we, <clears throat> that be safe folks, context here in Timothy was to a young preacher and to his people that follow him, that we, and I believe God wants us to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And I know there's some factions out there where people say, oh, we've got to go militant. Us Christians, man, we've got to march on the Capitol. Well, I, I got all that. And you're looking at a guy that's preached on the street almost all of my life. First message I ever preached, I preached on a street corner in Aurora, Indiana. And that's Whiskey Town. Sigrams is down there in Lawrenceburg. And, you know, I was right down the road from a bar preaching my first message. So there's a little of that in me, and I understand that. But our real job is not trying to reform the nation as a people in, a, in, in some kind of a militia. Our job is to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ and to pray for those that are in leadership. And I know we get, well, you got to, <clears throat> why don't you run for office? Well, I... I have the highest calling on my life that could be, and that's the call to preach. So I'll just stick with that calling. I don't have to be the mayor, amen? <laughs> I don't have to be the governor, no. I don't need all that. You say, well, don't you play a role? I do. Right here in the text, he says uh, that we ought to pray for them, and I'll cover that there in Romans 13 in just a moment, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. It's about godliness and honesty. And that in itself is diametrically opposed to the way most of the world believes today. So Romans, look if you would in Romans chapter 13, verse, verse 1. In Romans 13, verse 1, he says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, and uh, context here so we get it. Now, I know there's Ephesians powers, powers in high places. I got that. There's principalities and powers. But the context here in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, is basically it was to the Roman government that was in charge of the known world of the day that Paul wrote this. So he's talking about those sheriffs, <laughs> police officers, governors, presidents, so you understand the context here. He's not talking about the powers of the air, the spiritual wickedness in high places. So we understand Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul, and he's writing to those saved folks there in Rome, save Pope people. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, that be your governors and your tax collectors and your all the people that we sometimes easily want to disdain just a little bit, you know. And they raise the taxes again. What's wrong with this? Indiana, good old Indiana, land of taxes. Well, I drove to Ohio today, and your taxes are just as high. Oh, let me get on there. For there is no power but of God. Amen. It doesn't matter who's president, who's governor. 
God's still in control of this thing. Amen. He hadn't lost control yet. So we get to worrying about it. And by the way, if God isn't fixing it, I don't think you're going to fix it. Amen. Just do, just do what God says. He said, the powers that be are ordained of God. In other words, he's got his hand on the heartbeat of this thing. Don't you, you say, well, I don't know, Biden's the president, man. You know, and I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Don't worry, God knows what's going on. Amen. Well, I don't know about Putin, man. He's running Russia over there, and he just passed some laws and lets him run for another 12 years. I know, but God's got his hand on the heartbeat of this thing. Amen. Well, I don't know about those little countries down in Africa, and they're doing genocide, and they're doing this. And they're, listen, the whole world life and wickedness, God knows all about it. Amen. And he did the most wonderful thing that anybody could have done, and that's allowed his son to come right. to this earth and die for the Amen. sins of a wicked world. Amen. So here, the powers that be are ordained of God. I never got too excited about if it was a Republican or a Democrat got in the White House. You say, why? He's going to be gone in four years, and if he's lucky, eight. Or unlucky, I don't know how you want to look at that. And then we'll get somebody else. He said, well, it might be just as bad as we. Well, yeah, I know about it. Look, I was in the military armed services. You know who the president was that signed my, my honorable discharge? Yeah, Richard Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, I'm not going there. Amen. But anyway, who, verse 2 in Romans 13, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resist the ordinance of God. So God has an ordinance and a thought and a desire uh, for we, his people, that are supposed to be trying to live peaceably, that we might obey the powers and signs. You know, I was careful when I drove up here. I knew the speed limit was 55. I knew I had plenty of time. So I kind of drove 65-ish. <laughs> I, I, I generally would have drove 70-ish. <laughs> <laughs> you say, what'd you do? <laughs> I was thinking about the state trooper that might be watching me. <laughs> and I could hear him. I got pulled over one time on 32 going to Adams County. He was running out to us, passing a church in Cincinnati. Monday morning come, all pastors think they're off on Mondays. I don't know if you do, Brother Dave. I thought I was off, you know. Had Bonnie in the car. I was driving out there. Had a couple little kids in the car. Was he was young, man. I had the church car. It was a a 83 Mercury Marquis wagon, wood grain size. That's the car they bought. Well, I had to have, I had six kids at the time. And I'm wheeling out through there. I got a big old black Bible laying up on the dashboard of that car. And, you know, I took it with me everywhere. You know, that's what you do. You're a preacher. And I'm sailing out through 32, and there's a green grass strip, two lanes going east and two lanes going west. And, you know, and it's lightly raining. And I'm looking down, and speed limit's probably 55, and I'm doing about 65. And that was back in the years when 55 saved lives. I don't know what it does now. I've lost track. And I saw this trooper coming this way, and I said, there's no way he's going to go across that green grass in that trooper car, and it raining. He flashed them lights on me, whipped out across that green grass like he was a NASCAR tryout, and ran me down. I just pulled over to the room and sat there. Bonnie said, you're getting what you deserved. <laughs> My wife's always been very helpful that way. <clears throat> Traveled with her for over almost 30 years in three different RVs. <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting there, you know, and thinking, oh boy, now I'm just, just step up, suck it up. He was breaking the speed limit. He walks up to the car, you know, I'm rolling. I had a power window that rolled that window. Driving a little fast there this morning, weren't you, sir? I said, yes, sir. He says, where are you headed? I said, Adams County. He says, what's that big Bible laying on your dash? Oh, I'm a pastor <coughs> at uh, High Point Baptist Church there in Sharonville, Ohio. Oh, you are? <laughs> he says, well, how about that? You catch sinners on Sunday, and I catch them on Monday. <laughs> And wrote me a ticket for thirty-two dollars for breaking the speed limit. Back then, now you can't get a ticket for thirty-two dollars today, but back then it was thirty-two dollars ticket. I've never forgot that. My wife has never forgot that. Right. Say <laughs> so what? Why'd you tell that story? We supposed to abide. The, 
I still look over my shoulder for a state trooper. <laughs> I was looking this morning. So we're to abide by the powers that be, and they that resist shall receive to themselves. Now this is in context here of some hurt, and the word damnation in its definition doesn't mean they're going to hell. It means they're going to face the penalty right. or the wrath of the government, in which I've felt that a little bit, and I won't ask for your stories. I don't want to know about the deer you shot out of season or the time you went coon hunting before season opened. I've heard all the stories. <laughs> anyway, so for in verse three, for rulers are not a terror to good works, no, uh, but to evil. As laws are for the law breakers, yeah. not the law keepers. Amen. Right. <laughs> Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Question. That you shouldn't have to be. If you ain't breaking the law, you shouldn't be. Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. So, second, that's the first verse, but human government is one of the four institutions that God ordained in the word of God. I, I, the home is the first institution that God ordained and, and mentions. Mm -hmm. The first, human, uh, the man and the wife. And so we find that laid out early in the book of Genesis. Matter of fact, all four institutions uh, show up early in the Word of God, especially in Genesis. By the time you get out of the first five books of the Bi first five books of the Bible, you have all four institutions talked about. Number one, the home, and God ordained the institution of the home. The second one that I'll give you here is human government, and that's kind of where we're at today. God ordained human government. Romans chapter 13 here in the uh, New Testament. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, God is known as a God of law, statutes, and he set forth those laws and statutes. So uh, human government is a, and God knows, God knows what's wrong with human government. Yeah. And there's no human government that's perfect. You say, why? <laughs> because it's man run, but God knows it. He's got his hand on the heartbeat of it. Yeah. Now, that's the second institution. The third institution was the Jew. When he called Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees, he discriminated against every other people and every other nation on the face of the earth, and he called a man out, and Abraham became the first Jew, and the Jewish people, through Jacob and the 12 patriarchs, are the chosen people of God. They are the people of God. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Although Israel is in blindness by part today, according to the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, God is not done with the Jew. It's still his chosen people. But the Jew, that's an institution that's never going to change. It'll come back into focus after the tribulation, so on and so forth. No, no time to teach on that today. But I'll give you these four. The home, human government, the Jew, and the last institution shows up in the New Testament. It's alluded to in the Old Testament, but it's not clear until we get the New Testament is the church. I don't know if you understand that, but the local church, the body of Christ, is an institution that's not going to change. Now, the devil can kick, holler, scream, whatever he wants to do, but the Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church Amen. of God. You say, why? It's one of those institutions. There's uh, basically four. You might get squeezed the fifth one out someplace, but those are four institutions that God ordained, and they're addressed to four pillars in the Word of God. Four pillars show a picture of strength on this earth that's God ordained. We'll go on that later. So, human government. Okay, he says here, lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. This is pretty contrary to the way that most folks view things. <laughs> Yeah, well, I drive 55, you can drive 65. Man, I've been there. Uh, but definitely how we are to live as Christians. So we ought to try to do right, especially before a fellow man. And I think that state trooper was having a heyday with me that day, blaming me trying to catch sinners on Sunday and him doing his job catching them on Monday, but did not hesitate to write me a ticket. So I got the message. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse, we read verse 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, uh, uh, sight of God our Savior. So these things are good. Here we learn what to pray for. 
uh, verse 1, exhort therefore that first of all, the two principal parts of public worship being the ministry of the word and prayer, as we learned in the first chapter, I'm not teaching the first chapter of Timothy, but that was in the series of lessons that I taught. We also learned what is acceptable to the Lord, what actually pleases him. Uh, I like the word pleases him. Sometimes we stop with just acceptable in him. So 2 Timothy 2, verse 4, No man that war the tame himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Uh, so we have a job to, to do, a role as a child of God. And that soldier, we're called soldiers, and today's set-aside day, this holiday, this memorial day, is for those that paid the ultimate price, the sacrifice of their life, uh, for our freedom and our liberties. Um, and, and I honor that. My dad was a soldier. Uh, my dad lived through the Second World War. He was a highly decorated uh, Marine reconnaissance. I didn't find this out until about six years ago. Uh, when he died, he died eight, nine, he died 12 years ago. They did not hand me this, they handed me a box about that big with all his military stuff in it. And they said, Philip, is the only one in our family that went to the military, he would probably like to have this. And so six years ago, they gave me that box. I have no idea what my dad did in the Marine Corps. Uh, through a colonel, a Marine colonel, that worked uh, down at the Noah's Ark Project, we became friends. He said, why don't you give me your dad's name? I showed him, I took a picture. I, I laid all his medals out. I didn't know what they were, I had no idea. And I didn't research it. Just took a picture of it and I sent it to him. And uh, he texted me back and he said, hey, Phil, we need to talk. And I, I'm busy doing whatever I was doing down there. I texted him back and I said, talk, well, just tell me over, text me. He says, no, man, meet me down on the ground floor. We need to talk eyeball to eyeball. So I went down there and he said, your dad was a hero. You see that medal right there? I said, yeah. He said, that's a silver star. Do you realize in the 4th Marine Corps Division in the 5th, there were only 640, he started spitting this stuff out, but he knew all this stuff. Only 640-something men that got the Silver Star. I said, I didn't know that. Man, it brought, man, I'm a seven, at the time I was a 69-year-old man. I had never known that, never heard that. It was a miracle my dad lived. He was missing in action for five weeks. That whole military campaign he was in lasted 68 days. That's it. And man, he was missing in action for most of that time. And when he finally, he, he got out of that thing and he come back. Uh, but there were oh so many. And I think the reason he couldn't talk about it is because he saw too many of them die. And that's what this day is about. Those men that died. That we could enjoy this peaceable, quiet day the weather this nice in a church where nobody's telling us we got to bow to the emperor of Japan. Amen. <laughs> to the dictates of an emperor somewhere. So now I'll tell you what. So uh, the Bible has a lot to say. No man that wore the times of affairs of this life. No, my business as a soldier now in the Lord's army are spiritual things. Amen. And uh, Paul goes on with the thought in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, give and save folks, and exhort you uh, by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. He wants us to abound more and more. Blessings of God. Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God we're in our own warfare here. We're... we're and, and somebody died that we might be free. I'll talk about that later in the message. But Paul telling Timothy, who, in verse 4 of our text, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. That's our job. Amen. Seeing folks get in, get saved. Uh, it is God's will that all would be saved, but sadly not the will of every man to be saved. Right. Every man has the opportunity, but doesn't mean they will. Man, my heart leaped when I saw these children here today. You say, why? because I got saved as a child, 12 years old. I still remember my Sunday school teacher, old Bert Hensley, going around the room that morning. We used to all sit in the room, we had a boys class. And 
uh, I was one of the boys in that class, and he'd go around the room and he'd say, Billy, are you saved today? And I remember it so well, because when he'd point, he didn't have no finger on this hand. It, it was gone. And he'd just point that nub at you. And for a 12-year-old boy, you remember that stuff. <laughs> and he's sitting there looking at that like, you don't have a finger. And that's very impressionable to a child. But he was so sincere, he'd say, Billy, do you, are you saved? He would just go around the room and ask every boy every time he was in there, and Billy said, no. He said, okay, then we got to work on that. Then he'd go around, Jimmy, are you saved? Yeah, I got saved last week, you know. Okay, good, you still saved today. He'd go around and he'd come to me, Philip, are you saved? I'd say, uh, I was a little slow, I, you know. At 10, 11 years old, I was up with the rest of the pack. I didn't know what he was talking about. Saved from what? The weather? You know, I just, you know, no comprehension. <laughs> One of those kids, you know. <laughs> you say, what was that? Under the age of accountability. I had no idea. But you know, as that class went on, he'd teach the class, and he'd go back around the room and pray with each one of us. And it was because of Bert Hensley, Hensley's Sunday school hour for young kids and I was in that class that I began to get under conviction. We had a revival meeting. The evangelists come in in 1962. I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, but not in church. I didn't know. I, I got saved at home, sitting at the kitchen table. My mother, who's still alive today, by the way, 92 years old, she'll be missing me. I'm generally on camp somewhere, and she tunes me in. She doesn't get out much anymore. If you want to know where I'm at, I'll hear from her Monday. <laughs> but you know what, 92, I tend to listen. <laughs> but because of Bert, Hensley, and a Sunday school class, and then my mother, I got saved hey. as a child. So my heart leaps within me when I see young people come into the church. Uh, that's They're the next generation of the Lord Terry. So it's God's will that all would be saved, but sadly, not all will be saved. And there's plenty of thoughts and verses on most of that. I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and then again verse 5 for there is one God, one meeting between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we're reminded again of these beautiful things and then Ephesians chapter 4, 4 through 6, people have asked me all my life, what do you do? You're an evangelist. What do you do? Now pastor, I know what he does. <clears throat> So, but in event, I know what the teacher does. What do you do? You're an evangelist. Well, I, I do the same thing the pastor does or a teacher does. Because I'm found in the same catalog there in Ephesians chapter 4 where he gave some. He starts off with prophets, apostles, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. And the prophets and the apostles, he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, 15, and 16, have passed off the scene. And so what you have left is pastors, evangelists, and teachers. Yeah. And he says, okay, what do they do? And it says in the very next verse, for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry. So the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher all do basically do the same thing. Where the pastor may be a little more stationary, he, we were talking this morning, he needs to show up every Sunday morning, you know. Because <laughs> that's the evangelist. <laughs> He's going to do a little more traveling. And that's kind of how it's been for me in my life. I've traveled, went many places, done many things. But that's how God works. But in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there's one body, one spirit, even as you're called on one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God the Father, and all who is above all, through all, and in you all, one God for all men. Romans 3, 9 through 12, Paul again elaborates. What then? Are you better than they? No. No. The implied answer is actually written there in the scripture. No. In no wise we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under sin. And as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of our way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In this warfare that we're in, which is a spiritual thing, we war against the principalities and the power and the spiritual wickedness in high places. We understand that. But we have a job to do. And the Holy Ghost of God, the Word of God, can be used in a magnificent way to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ, in spite of all the opposition, in spite of the world, in spite of the frills. Uh, 
the, the beautiful weather, uh, the necessity to be out and do all things. Uh, we're in America. We still can win and fight a battle for the Lord. Isaiah the prophet said this, Isaiah 42 and verse 1, I love this verse. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And what's he talking about? He's talking about the job. We're Gentiles. But anybody that wasn't a Jew is a Gentile. Uh, but we're Gentiles saved by grace, make up the church. And Isaiah prophesied of it, so that's what we do today. Uh, Paul, again, I'm back in my text, 1 Timothy 2, verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Of course, that's Christ. I haven't had you turn much, but look, if you would, turn with me to Matthew 20. Uh, I'll be in Matthew a few minutes this morning as we try to bring the message, but look, if you would, at Matthew 20. And in the Gospel of Matthew, the first, the first writer uh, gives this, this verse. He says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's exactly what was accomplished. That's what he did. And we today are uh, recipients of that everlasting life, that freedom that we enjoy in Christ. Paul simply reminding us who gave himself a ransom for all, that's Christ. To be testified in due time, that's Christ. Then in verse 7 of our text, 1 Timothy, did I say first? I probably said 2 Timothy all the time, but I mean 1 Timothy. I should have said 1 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, that's us. I speak the truth in Christ, and I am not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Say, that's us. Amen. Amen. So, Abide by the laws of the land. Why? Because we're saved. Why? Because we're civil. Why? Because uh, God said we're supposed to. That's Amen. right. Uh, notice, not, not a common preacher of the word, the Apostle Paul, but an apostle, a special called place, only upon the first 12, as the Lord ordained 12 apostles, the Lord himself chose while on this earth the many. For the apostles have to have seen the Lord. I get asked about this Sunday. Well, you know, people say they've seen the, the Lord. Well, I, I'm going to stay with what Peter said. No man has seen him at any time since his resurrection. And we won't see him again until he appears. And Peter was an authority on this thing because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there uh, when the Lord was transfigured. So when people come along today and say, well, I saw Jesus the other day. Be careful with that. Be careful with that. Uh, not according to the Word of God. Because... And I, uh, we, it wasn't too long ago, we had a, a young man, I'm going to say young man, but anybody 50 or younger is young to me now. <laughs> he came to church and he said, I'm apostle so-and-so. And I'm thinking, <laughs> immediately my theological mind is rolling. <laughs> he looked good. He had a Bible, three-piece suit on. His wife looked good. You know, she was dressed right for church. His kids looked good. But how he introduced himself, I'm apostle so-and-so. And I'm thinking, apostle like in the Bible? There won't be. What? You know, and I'm, but I'm being hate. I'm the associate senior pastor in the church. I don't have a lot to say. I said, well, good to have you today. But I couldn't call him apostle in good faith. Well, it's good to have you today. I, I hope you're here <laughs> and get a blessing. I know you're here to get a blessing. So we went on, we went on, we went on. The guy showed up again, showed up again, showed up again, showed up again. He actually thought he was an apostle. I mean, one in the Bible. I said, now look, wait. And we had we had a discussion a little later. Because he asked me, are you a real doctor? Or are you just, I said, look. <laughs> Liberty Baptist Bible College and Theological Seminary, they say I am. I don't feel like I am. I'm just Brother Phil. That's how I answered and I couldn't help myself. Are you a real apostle? <laughs> He's looking at me like, or did your mother and daddy name you apostle? And he knew then I was being a little facetious. Well, no, I'm an apostle. I said, okay, can we put the test of apostle upon you? And he said, well, I'll go mildly at first. He said, well, yeah, sure. Have you seen Jesus? Yeah, I've seen Jesus standing at the foot of the bed. I saw Jesus. And I'm like, I've got a live one here. 
So I said, okay, uh, good. I said, what about next? I said, can, can you take a, can, can I try the word of God out on you? Can you, can, well, yeah, yeah, put it on me, man. Put it on me. <laughs> I said, can you handle a deadly serpent? <laughs> Paul the apostle was able to there, you know, on Miletus when he picked up the wood on a rainy day when they were shipwrecked and a serpent fell out of those sticks when they put them on the fire and bit him and they thought that possibly he should die he was such a criminal but he lived and then they knew wow something supernatural here so an apostle could he could he could handle the poisonous viper hanging on can you handle snakes well I'm about them snakes now I don't them snakes I said then you can't drink deadly poison and live no I said good because I got a bottle of drain here drain over here I wanted you to try now I was really being facetious I said, can you raise the dead? No. And so you say, what happened? Did he come back? Yeah, he came back. Ask more questions. <laughs> you just never know, man. You say, what happened to him? He got all straightened out, realized, come to me one day. I guess I'm not an apostle. <laughs> I said, wow. He became one of the best Bible students we had in the class. He straightened right up. Some church in Palestine, Indiana, called him the pastor. He's still there today, but he doesn't call himself an apostle, amen? <laughs> Say, why? I guess Brother Phil was going to get a snake out for him to have. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Say, what, what, what's that about? Just teaching and preaching the Word of God and its pureness and its holiness and its causing us to be peaceful and content with what we have. Uh, Timothy. 1 Timothy 2, 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. And that's actually where I was going. I'm getting done here. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So he takes notice only of men, not that women cannot or should not pray, but only in a public meeting place as the church, so on and so forth. I got that. I sometimes have to cover that, but here, not necessarily. But I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. You know what? I kind of like said, you hold your hands up when you pray? Not always. But there are times that I have and that I do. You say, why? Because he told me to. And you know, there's something about it. Get off by yourself someplace. Have yourself a prayer meeting and thank God for the freedom that you enjoy in Christ Jesus. For the freedom Amen. that you enjoy because of some soldier laid his life down for your life. And put your hands up for the Lord when nobody can see you. And say, God, thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for, number one, dying on the cross that I might go free. And thank you for some soldier that died that I can live in a free country. Amen. And it'll change you. You can be sitting in a public place. The next thing you know, your hand will be up. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you say, do you do that? I see my wife one time sitting back there. And she's not a very vocal person. And I was preaching. I generally can see her. She doesn't don't say much, do anything. Great soul winner. Always could win somebody the Lord. I seen her back there one time with a white handkerchief going like this. <laughs> she wasn't running the aisles. She wasn't shouting amen. I'll tell you what. She was lifting her hands to the God that saved her. Because how great that is. That's a great thing. This liberty that I enjoy, this freedom that I enjoy, this liberty that you have, this freedom that you have in Christ Jesus Amen. is worthy to lift up holy hands and pray. Amen? Amen. I'm going to be done here, give you a few minutes to fellowship, and I don't know how you can generally do your service, but it seems appropriate to quit about now. So we will. So let's pray and close out. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for a chance to teach just a little bit share a few thoughts from the scriptures and uh, from life. And Lord, you're truly a wonderful Savior to me. Bless now. In Jesus' name I pray and ask you, amen. God bless you. Good morning. I should turn this off.